Olá, pessoal. Boa tarde. Estamos aqui novamente, agora com o décimo episódio da websérie O Mundo Empreendedor, Expedição Israel. Estaremos aqui toda quinta, uma e meia, sempre com um convidado de peso, falando sobre os assuntos mais relevantes no ambiente de inovação e empreendedorismo aqui em Israel, um dos maiores polos tecnológicos do mundo. Eu sou Daniel Scaba, CEO da IBI Tech, que tem aproximado esse rico ecossistema de inovação do público brasileiro. Já estou aqui em Israel há quase 30 anos, vivenciando inovação e tecnologia em todas as suas formas, na faculdade, no exército, em multinacionais e como empreendedor. E agora, aqui com vocês, mergulhando nesse mundo de inovação e empreendedorismo. E antes de chamar o nosso convidado especial de hoje, gostaria de chamar a Bárbara para passar uns recados. Oi, Bárbara, boa tarde. Olá, boa tarde, Daniel. A voz até falhou aqui já. <risos> Bom, primeiro aqui, para a gente poder ambientar já o nosso público, como sempre, vim trazer alguns materiais complementares para todo mundo continuar se desenvolvendo em assuntos complementares também. Então, se vocês acessarem o nosso manual de bordo, que está aqui na tela, embaixo do Daniel, vocês vão ter acesso também a dois materiais. Um deles é o artigo Robôs Autônomos, qual sua importância dentro da indústria 4.0? E o outro fala sobre engenharia biomédica, né? Já que a gente vai falar um pouquinho aqui da biomecânica, né? Por que não também abranger um outro assunto que está relacionado? E no mais, queria convidar todo mundo a participar aqui com a gente do nosso Insight Premiado, que é basicamente você tirar uma foto, um print aqui da nossa tela enquanto a transmissão está acontecendo, postar no, nosso, no, no seu Instagram Stories, marcando o arroba Grupo Voito e colocando qual é o insight ali que você gostaria de compartilhar com as outras pessoas. Postando, você já está participando e pode ganhar um livro de Excel da nossa editora ou um kit da Voito com alguns mimos bem bacanas para vocês. E no mais, convidar vocês também a participarem, já se inscreverem aqui no nosso canal, deixar o seu like se você estiver assistindo pelo YouTube. E é isso, vamos lá que o conteúdo hoje está sensacional. Maravilha, obrigado, Bárbara. E pessoal, now I'd like to invite Professor Alon Wolf for a chat about how to integrate research, innovation, and technology in biomechanics. Hello, Alon. Thanks for accepting our invitation. Hello, Daniel. Thank you for inviting me. Alon is a professor in the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering at Technion Institute of Technology in Israel. For me, it's an honor to have you here today. I received my degree in engineering of computers from Technion many years ago. Besides many achievements, Professor Wolf founded a biorobotics and biomechanics research lab with the goal of developing fundamental theories and its applications in medical robotics and biorobotics. Today, Alon is the vice president for external relations and resource development in Technion. Alon, Technion has become this leading academic and research institute in the world when it comes to technology and innovation. What are the main milestones of this centenary organization? Well, actually, the, when you're talking about the milestones, you have to go back, really, almost one, more than 100 years ago. Exactly. The reason and, the, and, and why the Technion was established. This, the Technion was established in this, in in 1912 the cornerstone was laid here in Haifa this was part of the Ottoman Empire it was a village it was not even a city before the country the Israel Israel was established and with the vision that in order to build a country you need to build the ecosystem uh, to make it a reality you need to have engineers scientists that will develop the roads the electrical system the water system the agriculture, the electronics later on, etc., etc. So in many ways, the Technion was actually the milestones of the development of the Technion, as you asked me, are embedded, are combined with the milestones of the development of the country. And we see as part of our mission, and you know, as a Technion graduate, you also probably uh, experienced, by the way, My son is a second year student in, your same, in computer science, the same department that you graduated. Now nice. my son, so nice. It's a look here. So uh, as I said, if you look at the development of the country and the development of the Technion, the Technion put as a mission from day one, 
The Technion was established 24 years before there was a country. The mission was to go side by side with the development of the country and we feel responsibility even until today for the economy, for the ecosystem, the industrial ecosystem, the, 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 the financial, the social ecosystem of the country. So um, if you look at the development, you know, uh, the building was, the first building was established in 1912 and then in 1924 we opened our gates and we started teaching because in between 12, 1912 and 1924, World War One was happening here, so there was no teaching. And 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 the, the main milestones were, of course, the establishment of the country in 1948, and then you need to develop technologies for roads, electricity, water. Later on, you know, stepping you know forward, water desalination because of this area, um, and and um, and then um, you see the microelectronics which was also started here at the Technion in the 60s because Israel had uh, difficulties to, to, to get uh, microelectronic technologies. So the Technion stepped in and said, hey, let's develop a microelectronic facility on campus and it will serve the entire country. So in many ways, the microelectronics, the well-known microelectronics uh, ecosystem of Israel started here at Technion. Later on, the nanoelectronics now uh, quantum mechanics and one of the main thing or my one thing we are very proud of 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 course are our graduates our graduates like yourself are key people in industry and in economic in 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 israel and in, in worldwide and 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 they made a big difference uh, dov moran with the memory stick the memory stick was invented by a technion graduate nice. uh, Mehuda with the water irrigation the water drip the pipe that Waters the fields efficiently was developed by a Technion graduate. Um, the nano Bible, the nanotechnology, um, Mazo Robotics, the robot for spine surgery, um, Novocure for brain cancer and now Lyme cancer, uh, the Zeven Lempel algorithm for data compression that was invented here. Without that, no technology, no communication, nothing. And this actually happened because the country developed, the needs developed, and the Technion had to develop and build itself side by side because of the sense of responsibility that we feel. So not many universities in the world have the privilege um, to develop and, and be, be responsible in many ways in it for the development of a country. And now, that's it. It's very interesting because you're mentioning some of the graduates of the Technion, but you're also mentioning the Technion itself as a research institute, the, the cooperation with the industry, understanding the real needs of the country at the beginning and today, the real needs of the whole world. So how Technion is different in this sense of cooperation with the reality and not only papers for scientific uh, 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 magazines? Well, you know, let's distinguish, you know, researchers need to publish, you know, publish or perish. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> this is how we are measured. We are measured as researchers, of course. But I think it's the Israel, and you probably understand this, Daniel, it's the Israel in nature to be, to, to give solutions, to, to, to respond and give solutions. And it's something that drives us. Uh, along the way, and in that sense, we were always connected, and we are always connected with the industry. And we have a huge project now, smartifying the industry in Israel, making it more I for those who are not. You know, there is the high tech. The high tech is is good, but what about the mid tech and the low tech? If they don't become digital, they don't become smart, they will not survive. You know, Forbes predicted two thirds of the companies in the world globally will not survive. Uh, the I4 revolution, the Industry 4 revolution, and, and we feel responsible for that. So we build bridges between academia and the industry to build a, 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 a dynamic ecosystem where, um, you know, our R&D research on campus is then implemented in industry that becomes more advanced, therefore attract more talented students that we have to educate so creating some kind of a, a ecosystem that one 
feeds the other the, the, the academy, the technion, the industry, the industry feeds back the, the, the university. Um, and, um, and as I said, it's, it's part of the Israeli, um, um, I would say, DNA of, of operation where, you know, failure is not, it's not a bad word, word in Hebrew. Actually, it's very good. You know, if you fail, you learn. You learn more from your failures than from your success. Actually, in Israel, there is an annual festival. I don't know if you have ever been there, Daniel. I encourage you to go. Of people going on the stage, telling about their failures, sharing their failures with the audience yeah, so that the yeah, audience yeah. can experience it and learn from it. I cannot go to this, uh, this place because if I take the stage, I don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, fa failure is build you up and and we're not afraid to fail you know some other cultures failure is something which is it's exactly it's it's, it's um um it's something that you cannot recover from uh and again add to this this the sense of responsibility that we feel like you know uh, you know we have responsibility for the development and for what is happening here um and of course the directness, you know, the fact that we can talk and chat like this. I think the Brazilians people, as far as I experience it, it has a little bit the same, you know, open, being open, being open to hear, to get critics. You know, it's okay. Let's move on. Let's see how we can build on that. So this put all this ecosystem, this whole culture together. And if you understand why Technion is, with industry works so, so well, and you know, we've, we've taken some... Um, 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 very serious measurements uh, and, and steps lately. Uh, companies are coming into campus. PTC just signed a, an agreement that they move their PTC is one of the global, well, the world largest corporate in, in industry four. Uh, it's, a, it's a mega company from the United States. They have a big risk R and D center in Israel. They're moving their R and D on campus. So. Researchers, students, postdocs could go work there, integrate there. Their, their researchers could work in our lab. So there's going to be an ecosystem here feeding wow. itself. And we're looking for more companies to come on campus and build this, this ecosystem when one benefits from the other and together one and one equals three, not two. One of the most impressive milestones in my personal view was when... Technion was chosen with Cornell to be the, the center of technology in New York and not MIT and not Harvard. How do you explain that? Well, I'll give you what uh, May Bloomberg, when my pre uh, previous president, uh, uh, Peretz Lavi, um, was invited to New York when, when Mayor Bloomberg announced that Technion and Cornell are the winners, he asked uh, Mayor Bloomberg, you know, I can understand why you approach Cornell, why you approach Carnegie Mellon, uh, why you approach Stanford, you know, Berkeley, MIT. But why did you approach Technion? And Mayor Bloomberg said that because you're the only university in the world who, could, who took Jaffa oranges and converted them to semiconductors. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's, that's the answer. Um, and... You know, the vision of Mayor Bloomberg was to make New York the Silicon Valley of the East Coast. Now, it was really, he's a visionary, and he made it happen. And if you follow now all the reports, it is happening. You know, New York, I think, is second after, is, is actually getting even closer to the Silicon Valley. It's creating, there's an ecosystem there of innovation, of startups, that you know happens on this island on Roosevelt Island somewhere between Manhattan and Queens just across from the UN building uh, it's a beautiful campus I encourage everyone who is in New York to visit it take the tram from the second avenue and 59th street it's a beautiful ride and it's an ecosystem where you, innovation is in the air it's it's about innovation so um yeah that's 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 why we were probably asked no, that's incredible. And the other place in the world where Technion has a strong position is China. There's a branch of Technion in China. Now, my question to you is that, okay, we do have Technion methodologies and principles 
but also have the mindset of the Israelis. So how they said technology uh, way of doing things, Technion way of doing things works in China with a completely different way of thinking and doing things? Oh, well, uh, it's actually, it's an excellent question and a very challenging, uh, very challenging one. You know, uh, in a way, there's a very good book that I always read to my students called Everything I Had to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. So education starts in, in kindergarten, actually. And, and here we're opening a university in China, in Guangdong. By the way, another visioner, uh, Mr. Li Kashin, uh, who had the vision um, to build this, uh, ecos this university. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, in many ways, this is an extension of the Technion. You know, we, we, we are there, Technion professors are there. You know, every faculty that teaches there is a professor at the Technion or is a faculty at the Technion. And with that, we try to bring the mode of thinking of, of, uh, of the Israeli nature as, and culture, as you said, into the Chinese culture, you know, we don't, we don't think we can change, you know, and we don't want, we don't have the aspiration to change. But if they get 10%, 15% of that, it's more than, than what is, you know, what is there. And, 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 yeah. and, and, I, and I remember again, another story from uh, uh, President Peretz Lavi, because when he, they opened the branch there and they had the celebration, um, one of the students that escorted him was a Chinese student who actually spent a few years in Israel, in Tetechnion, two years in the Tetechnion, so she spoke Hebrew. Nice. Um, and and when, when, when this kind of question was, he was asked about the same, some, same principle, what is the difference? This student, this is what President Peretz told me, she said, President Peretz, can I answer the, the question instead of you? And she, she told the story. That she was an A-plus student in China. Perfect scores, 100 all the time, A-plus, whatever the, the system is. One day, the teacher calls to her parents and wants to complain. And her parents sits there and said, what? And the complaint was, she's asking too many questions during classes, and she's disturbing the class. And she said, this thing would have never happened in Israel, or in Israel. The because the first thing my students do when I teach them something is, Alon or Professor Wolf, I have a question. I think you have something wrong there. They always challenge you. They always want to know and they always ask questions. So if we were able to bring a little bit of this spirit to ask questions, not to be, not, not to be afraid to ask and question and always doubt, um, and it's a bit, a little bit about, you know, the Judaism, the Judaism, you know, the, the Talmud, you know, you, you probably know this, Daniel, you always, you sit together and the whole idea of sitting together and learning this chapter in the Bible or in the Talmud is to argue. Yes. And to debate. So if exactly. we can take this a little bit, uh, we'll... Yeah, we'll, the, the famous, the famous say, two Jews, three opinions. Oh, three opinions is... Four, five opinions, <laughs> ten <laughs> opinions. Who knows how many opinions? Yeah, exactly. Well, another impressive uh, uh, milestone of Technion is actually the Nobel Prizes. Yes. Uh, Technion uh, has, uh, or the Technion uh, professors, uh, uh, they won few uh, Nobel Prizes. So, uh, my question to you is: What makes an institute to be able to get to this level? and achieve a Nobel Prize. And the other side, what uh, a university that uh, won a Nobel Prize uh, gets back in terms of uh, whatever? Well, let's go for your second part. You know, what the university gets, of course, fame, glory, inspiration to others, attract more brilliant professors, more brilliant students, more, more everything. Now, how you do it, first you want to provide your professors, your faculty member, the best infrastructure that you can give them. You know, when we hire, it costs us about a million dollars in average to hire a new faculty. Someone 
who finished his PhD, did his postdoc, two, three years somewhere over the sea in a top university, then comes back to Technion. Cost us about a million dollars. I'm not talking about his salary or something. I'm talking about investment in his lab, equipment, etc. When I say in average, I mean the mathematician may need just a pen and a paper, but in life sciences and engineering, you may need an MRI scanner, which costs $10 million. So if you average, it's a million dollars. Last year, the year of the corona, we hired 35 new faculties, which means wow. Technion invested $35 million in average in building those labs, state of the line, state of the art, you know, technology and in infrastructure. So they have, they have all they need to run. Now it's about picking the right professors, giving them the infrastructure, giving them the students, the ecosystem, the, the peace and quiet of sitting in their lab and inventing and thinking about the next challenges and, and where they want to go. And of course, let's not take the credit from uh, Professor Hershko and Chekhanover and Shechman who won the Nobel because they not won the Nobel because they, you know, they were who they are. <laughs> it's their it's their achievement. You know, yeah. we you know Technion provided them with the maybe the the ecosystem, but they won the Nobel because because of who they are. You know, let's not <laughs> take this, yeah, this they, from them. They, you know, it's they, they, they invented the quantum crystals, not Technion. <laughs> let's 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 agree on 80-20. It always works. You know, 80% yeah. is them, 20% is what we get, you know, is the ecosystem they got. But you know, and you know, they were educated some in the Technion, and so some of them nice. so yeah. So uh, let's talk about about your million dollar because uh, you founded uh, the biomechanic biorobotic lab in Technion and uh, you mentioned a little while about uh, Mars Robotics uh, that is one uh, important achievement of uh, a graduate but in this area so can you tell a little bit about the the biorobotics biomechanics uh, projects uh, aimed to rehabilitation of human beings and how do you see the future of this area? How Technion can actually help in this area, in the whole world? So, um, um, you know, I, I did my PhD here, and uh, my part of my PhD was the robot for spine surgery, was Mazor. And then I, I moved on to Pittsburgh. I spent a few wonderful years in Carnegie Mellon as a postdoc and then faculty. And then I returned, and I, we opened there another company called Med Robotics for a snake robot for general surgery, perform surgery all over the world now. So, um, and, 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 you know, with these two technologies and it's very, not many universities have so many, and we have other robots that came out of this university. This is a big impact on, on humanities, on mankind. The fact that people have high technology performing surgery on, on, you know, when there is a need, it's a great benefit. You know, the risk for spinal, injuries during surgery before the robot was invented was 10%. One out of 10 patients, according wow. to literature, came out of surgery with some kind of a defect in the spine, in the spinal cord. And with the robot, it's 100%. You know, the fact that we're using now the snake robot for met robotics for minimally invasive surgery all over the body saves people life. Um, now, the work that I continue to do in the, in, the, in the lab we do is, is actually taking, and this is really a unique environment that we have at the tech Technion, is the combination of engineering and medicine. You know, the Technion has engineering, life science, and, 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 and exact sciences, and a medical school. And this ecosystem of en engineers, life science, exact science, and medicine is an amazing combination where you can take technology from bench to bedside, from the lab all the way to the patients, because we have the doctors affiliated with the medical schools, we have the medical centers, and we do that very often. Now, my work is focusing really on that, is understanding the pathophysiology, what goes wrong in the body. I, I do biomechanics, you know, biomechanically, and then trying to develop technologies that assist those people with the specific problems, whether it's, you know, hip or knee osteoarthritis, 
whether it's spinal problems, whether it's balance, neuromuscular problems, or whether it's a child that is born without a hand and needs a helping hand. And this is a project that we do it philanthropically and we give all over the world. We develop robotic and prosthetic wow. hands for free, low cost, printed for children all over the world, children even from Brazil. Some people from Brazil got the hand. Uh, we do it because it's our way of thanking the world and the, you know, the global village of what we have. So nice. taking the technology and the knowledge and actually implementing it to the benefit uh, of, of, of mankind in Israel and, and worldwide, you know, not just in Israel, in Brazil, in the UK, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in, in, in Jordan, and in Syria. We gave hands to, to refugees in Syria. doesn't matter. You know, a child is a child. doesn't matter where he is. This is beautiful, uh, especially in, uh, in these crazy days. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for sharing with us. Uh, Professor, we got a few questions from our audience. And uh, you just mentioned the multidisciplinary way of doing things in Technion. And the question of the audience is, what are the main areas where Technion today is involved and impacting the world? Okay. So in uh, the last two years with the new administration, we've decided to take, you know, Technion is built from 18 departments. By the way, going back to your one of the first question you asked, you know, we developed like this because we developed and these, these were needs. You know, Israel needed an aerospace or aeronautic department, we opened a department of, and which, which is the only one in the country, which in a way is a, is a headache for an administration to run 18 departments, but then you have a competition between them, so they create some kind of innovation. Oh, yes. Now, in the last two years, we've decided to build another layer on top of the faculties, the departments, and these are uh, kind of hubs, virtual hubs, around what we call the challenges of the 21st century. Okay. First of one of them is human health. Another one is energy and sustainability. And the last one is smart industry or digital industry. So in these hubs, we've created an environment where professors from all the campus interact together, postdocs, students, hired together by all the departments. We still keep the departmental structure, but we have those research infrastructure, or excuse me, research uh, hubs to host professors from all over um, uh, the campus to create innovation or new thinking. So we want to create an environment where professors from architecture uh, aeronautic, mechanical engineering, medicine, and chemistry meet and come up with an idea to serve and, 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 and solve some kind of a health issue or, or quality of life uh, improvement under the Human Health Initiative. The pillars, if you imagine the Human Health Initiative as a temple or as a building, the pillars are challenges like neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, heart disease, aging, etc. The horizontals are disciplines, robotics, AI, material science, electrical engineering, etc. The interaction between the disciplines and the challenges is where all the excitement is happening. So we're moved for discipline-centered research to challenges centered wow. research. Uh, of course, basic research will still have to take place in the labs, but we, tr we create this environment around those great challenges of the 21st century, human health, energy and sustainability, and advanced manufacturing and digital industry. And we focus all our efforts uh, uh, to solve these, these challenges. So creating a multidisciplinary uh, uh, environment in each of these clusters, each of these... Uh, Hubs. Inspiring. <laughs> Absolutely inspiring. But by the way, it means so that we put we have to invest, of course, money, philanthropic money, investment money, you know, 
we, it, it's not just a virtual environment. You have to build building <laughs> and infrastructure yeah. where people can meet and do all those big dreams. So, it, you know, talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of investments in, in creating this environment, it's not, it's not just words and a piece of paper. It's, it's things, as we say, boots on the ground. Yes. Well, I think it was a may amazing way to to end this uh, this interview, Professor. I would like to thank you so much for being with us today, sharing your vast experience, exposing to Technion to Brazil these achievements of Technion, the way of doing things of Technion, the place that was my second home for so many years. Thank you so much, Professor. Daniel, Wolf. Daniel thank you, obrigado. And I want to say one more last thing before uh, we Please. finish. Uh, I know that Brazil is still fighting the corona, and I want to tell uh, my our friends in Brazil, stay strong. You know, vaccine is there, and it, you know, it changed, it revolutionized what's happening now in Israel. There's almost, you know, corona is is treated almost like a flu because numbers are almost no patients, and this is science. This is this is a a perfect example how science can you know, benefit us can and have our life uh, made our life better. So I wish you good health, stay safe, and 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 hope to see you face to face in Brazil one day and and as soon as possible. Perfect. Thank you so much. And so important these words. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, Alan. Barbara. Wow. Meu Deus, Daniel, muito incrível. E acho que alguns, alguns convidados nossos já tinham falado um pouco sobre o Tecnion, como que lá realmente era um ambiente bem inovador, disruptivo e tudo mais. E agora a gente pode ter certeza, né? E eu acho que uma das coisas que eu consegui pegar aqui que mais contribuem para isso e que ele falou muito ao longo de todo o nosso bate-papo foi a questão do ecossistema. Da gente não só garantir, por exemplo, tecnologia, mas a gente garantir também todos os profissionais ao redor que são necessários para a gente poder montar um ecossistema que esteja preparado para poder fornecer aquilo que o país, as pessoas precisam. Então, eu acho que essa foi uma dica muito bacana, porque isso funciona no Tecnion, não é à toa, né, que você falou aí sobre o Nobel, enfim, várias agremiações aí também que o, o Instituto consegue... E não é diferente também com empresas, né? No mundo do empreendedorismo, a gente precisa garantir esse ecossistema também. E até mesmo qual que vai ser ali o propósito da empresa, de que forma a gente está contribuindo para esse ecossistema que a gente está inserido. Então, eu achei muito bacana essa questão. É, ele também falou algo que vários convidados nossos falam, que é a questão de não ter medo de falhar, de realmente pegar, ir lá, colocar a cara, a mão na massa. E se errar, foi um aprendizado. Ele comentou também sobre essa questão de ter um evento em que várias pessoas se reúnem para falar sobre as suas falhas, né? Incrível. Eu já ouvi falar sobre um desses que teve aqui em Juiz de Fora há um tempo atrás. Fiquei com muita vontade de ir também, porque com certeza é um, um ótimo aprendizado, né? A gente aprender com o erro de uma outra pessoa que falhou, mas que já sabe o que, que ela fez de errado e que agora pode estar ali disposta a ensinar também. Então, achei muito interessante... E, para mim, o macro mesmo é a questão do ecossistema. A gente precisa pensar de forma ampla e não só pensar ali no específico que a gente está querendo tratar e tudo mais. Ah, eu achei incrível esse final que ele mencionou, que o Tecnion mencionou esses três grandes pilares, que é a saúde humana, que é a questão da energia e sustentabilidade, e, por último, a indústria avançada, como três grandes temas e aí pessoas de todos os departamentos, de todas as faculdades dentro do Tecnion vão se juntando para pegar um dos desafios ou alguns desafios desses grandes temas. Eu já acompanhei alguns projetos que nasceram dali e hoje já são empresas com solução incrível no mundo inteiro. Realmente, é, é esse pensamento diferente de uma faculdade não manter... É, como sempre foi, senão como que eu posso me manter relevante e continuar atuando nesse mundo muito mais ágil, muito mais complexo do que era no passado, realmente incrível, e como eu falei, um orgulho muito grande de ter sido um estudante da faculdade e estar aqui conversando com o professor Wolf. Com certeza, inclusive isso me deu mais dois outros insights. 
Um deles foi quando a gente estava falando sobre a vacinação de Israel, e uma das coisas que foi falada foi justamente a questão de Israel conseguir unir vários profissionais diferentes em prol ali de um mesmo objetivo. E aí, por Exatamente. isso, conseguiu sacar nesse sentido. Tem tudo a Exatamente. ver com isso que você acabou de falar também. E o isso. outro ponto é justamente a questão de realmente desafiar as pessoas, de trazer esses desafios, não é simplesmente uma situação, são desafios que existem, precisam ser resolvidos, e as pessoas estão motivadas para poder conseguir encontrar essa solução, né? Então, entra até naquela questão que ele falou do, da professora que reclamou do aluno porque estava perguntando demais. Então, assim, isso Mas realmente é algo que não pode existir, a gente precisa desafiar as pessoas, fazer com que elas realmente se sintam instigadas a, a conseguir desenvolver ideias novas, inovadoras e tudo mais. Isso mesmo, maravilha. Bárbara, e pessoal, eu queria agradecer a vocês novamente por estarem aqui com a gente hoje e terem participado dessa conversa incrível com o professor Alon Wolf, e entendendo como é que é a base de todo esse movimento de inovação, que são as pesquisas científicas, que são as universidades. Então, pessoal, a gente se encontra na semana que vem com mais um convidado de peso. Não percam, estaremos aqui mesmo. Um grande abraço.